Today, we are answering some of the questions that you guys wanted answers to. And if you've got a question which you'd like to see answered in a future episode of this series, anything from how does a feedback loop work, to what's the difference between a planar and an electrostatic driver, to I don't know what the hell a bit is, and at this point I am too afraid to ask. Anything at all, head over to the headphones.com forum and submit your question in the audio support submissions thread. I'm Golden Sound, you're watching the Headphone Show by Headphones.com, and this is Audio Support. How can someone new to the audio hobby determine their preferred or target sound from Co? That is a really good question and one which almost everyone watching this video is going to have asked themselves at some point. And the simple answer is, you've got to go and try stuff. Because you can read through all of the forum threads in existence, you can watch all of the YouTube videos in existence, they cannot tell you what you are going to like, what your preferences are. They might be able to steer you towards good products generally and away from bad products generally, but they cannot tell you your preferences. To work those out, you've got to go and try stuff. So go to a can jam, go to a local meetup, go to an audio store that lets you demo stuff. Anything that will allow you to try at least a few headphones side by side, ideally, and make some notes, work out what you do and don't like about each of them, and then you can use all of the comparisons and information available online to work out what you are most likely to enjoy. And if you're in a situation or geographical location where you can't go and demo stuff, then you kind of just need to buy something. Get something which is generally regarded as good and has a lot of comparisons to it, like an HD600 from Sennheiser, for example. These are a relatively affordable, very good headphone, and there are comparisons between it and just about everything in existence. So if you get that, well, hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. But also, you can use that as a reference point to find comparisons, see what people are thinking of other headphones versus that, and you can use that to steer you towards the products that you are most likely to enjoy. What is the difference between Wave and Flack and Should I Care from Alex? Well, Alex, you should care in terms of how much storage space you've got available. You should not care in terms of audio quality, because when you play them back, the data that gets sent to your DAC is exactly the same. There is no difference. So a WAV file is just a raw, uncompressed way of storing PCM audio. For standard music, 16 bits per sample, 44,100 samples a second, it just stores every single one of those samples exactly as is. Let's say you had three consecutive samples and these were the values, it would just write those to the file. So all of the data is there, it is lossless, it's just taking up quite a lot of space. A FLAC file, on the other hand, is a lossless compression method, which means it doesn't lose anything. All of the data, when you play it back, is exactly the same, it just stores it more efficiently. So if you had those same three samples, rather than just storing them exactly as is to the file, it might store that first one, and then it would use a difference to store the second one. So instead of just writing the whole thing out, you just add plus this amount. That takes up a lot less space, and it's a lot more efficient, but when you do the maths and unpack it, you get the original samples back. Nothing is lost, it is lossless, it's just more efficient. There's quite a lot of tricks which Flack actually uses in terms of how it compresses things, including predicting stuff, which is kind of cool, but that's a video in and of itself. What is most likely to be the weak point in my audio chain, and what should I spend less time caring about? From Andrew Lissamore. I feel like I know that name from somewhere, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Anyway, I'm going to keep this to the essentials. I'm going to stick with the transducers, so your headphones and your speakers, your DAC, and your amp. Those are the three things which you need to make air wiggle. You don't need anything else. Power conditioners and streamers are... An accessory, and whilst there may or may not be benefits from using those, quite frankly, even though I'm an advocate for using some of those things, they are not going to be the limitation in your system. You shouldn't worry about them until you are very happy and settled with all of those three main components. Don't worry about that kind of stuff. This is a question that is very subjective though, so this is my opinion, this is not the right answer because there is no right answer. And you'll notice that online people will argue saying that you should spend all of your money on your transducers and nothing beyond an Apple dongle is a benefit. And there's other people who say you should spend equal amounts on your transducers and source gear or spend most of your money on your source gear. Personally, my view is that a good DAC and amp are benefits well worth having but they do not make the same difference as speakers or headphones. I spend most of my time reviewing DACs and amps, but it's not because I think those are the most important parts. I don't. I think the opposite. Headphones and speakers are the most important part of your chain, and you should spend most of your money there. Not only because they make the biggest difference, but also because, quite frankly, the DACs and amps you can get at lower price points in the last few years have gotten so good that the marginal benefit... You have to spend so much money in order to get something genuinely significantly better. A Syncer SA1 and a SMSL SU9 or something, you don't need to upgrade beyond that until you've got some really, really good headphones. So, personally, I would say the limiting factor is almost certainly going to be your transducers. Spend most of your money on those. Only start to really worry about source gear once you've got headphones that you are very happy and settled with. How do I stop buying stuff from Sebastian Arana? 
Um, if you figure that one out, let me know. Thanks. <sighs> voltage and current. How do you tell if an amp is good at current or voltage, and is there a type of amp that does both from Moore Audio? This is an interesting question because those terms get thrown about a lot, current capability and voltage capability, and misused a lot online. The simple answer to that last part, is there an amp that does both, is yes, all of them. Because in order to have any power, you have to have both current and voltage. Power is equal to voltage times current. So with no voltage, you have no power. With no current, you have no power. You need both to have power. As to how you work out what the maximum of each that an amp can supply is, for voltage it's typically fairly easy. Just take the highest impedance power rating they give you and plug that into an Ohm's Law calculator. And the voltage that shows there, that is likely, but not certain, but likely to be the highest voltage that that amp can supply. For current, it's a little bit trickier though for a couple of reasons. You can just take the lowest impedance power rating they give you, again, plug it into an Ohm's Law calculator and look at what the current there is because it can at least do that much but it can probably do more because 32 ohms, the voltage is likely to be the same as what you saw at that 300 ohm rating. So if that's the case, it means that voltage is probably still the limiting factor there, meaning it's probably still got a bit more current to go. But also with most amps, not all, but most, as you go up in voltage, the amp behaves mostly the same until you hit that absolute limit. It just performs the same, the same, the same, and then it just clips. That's not the same with current. A lot of amps, with current, it will just slowly degrade in performance until eventually it hits 1% total harmonic distortion. It kind of depends on how much feedback the amp is using and the overall design, but current isn't a hard limit in the same way that voltage is for most amp designs. So they don't give you a spec for max current capability on most amps because it wouldn't be useful. I'd recommend watching the Do I Need an Amplifier video where I go into this in a bit more detail, but the long and short of it is you need to look at the distortion versus output level curve. That's what you're actually interested in. Go and watch that video because that explains the topic in quite a bit more detail. One I always come back to even years into the hobby and way down the rabbit hole is what exactly is Tamba and where does it live? From Chris NYC 75 Well, Tamba is quite simply the character or quality of a musical sound as distinct from its pitch or intensity. So what does that mean? Well, intensity, so loudness, is not a factor. Doesn't matter how loud it is, that is not part of Tamba. And distinct from its pitch because it's not the actual fundamental frequency, the actual note that's being played that we're interested in, it's everything else. All of the overtones and harmonics that make a trumpet sound different from a piano and sound different from a pure sine wave. You can play the same note on three different instruments and they don't sound the same because they have different timbre. So there's two main factors which build this up. There is the frequency domain aspect, described in a sort of static form. The specific frequencies and level of all of the different harmonic overtones that an instrument produces when playing a note that makes it different from any other given instrument. But it's not just a static form, because otherwise, if you had a perfectly neutral frequency response, that'd be it, you'd have perfect timbre. There's also a time domain aspect to it. This is called the envelope, and it describes how the frequency domain information changes over time. Because if you record a piano, and then play that recording in reverse, it does not sound the same as playing that recording normally, because whilst the frequency domain content has not changed, the envelope has. The attack, sustain, decay, and release are different. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about this, Isotope, who produces mastering plugins, uh, they've got quite a good page on this, so I'll link that in the description. But the summary is it's a function of frequency response, which needs to be able to accurately reflect the level of all of those overtones in order to produce timbre faithfully, and also the time domain aspect. You need to be able to get that decay profile right, as well as the attack itself and everything, as close to the real thing as possible. Does higher DAC Synad benefit those using the DAC for digital volume control? And can you explain how and why from Muse 5000? So, sort of. If you just look at the Synad measured at full output of the DAC, that's not necessarily going to give you a great indicator as to whether or not that DAC's going to be any good for digital volume control. Because quite a lot of DACs will actually perform slightly worse, or quite a lot worse in some instances, when they are outputting at or close to their maximum output, but then might get better when they're 10, 20, 30 dB in some cases below their maximum output. What you actually want to be looking at for digital volume control and whether the DAC's going to be good at it is the Synad versus output level curve. And you want to be looking at, okay, if I go down 40 dB, what is the Synad there? How much dynamic range do I have if I've already attenuated by 40 dB? Because the Synad at maximum output does not tell you that. I'd like to see some more in-depth thoughts you have about the best headphones you've heard, the Aperio, Sesvara, HE1, etc. What are some of the strengths for all of them from Dialux? Well, get subscribed, because we have a video on that very topic coming soon.
Why hasn't anyone attempted to measure or quantify dynamics of headphones from old Cobb? Quite frankly, because people don't agree on what that term means. In order to quantify and measure something, you first have to get people to agree what they're actually talking about. And whilst a lot of people might be agreeing on the same thing, you'll also see a lot of people saying that X headphone has no dynamics and it lacks impact, and other people say, no, it's fine, what are you talking about? So it's actually mostly a problem of people not agreeing what the term means, as is the case for a lot of audiophile terms. How much can one really change the sound signature of a setup by replacing source gear? Can you really take a cold leaning pair of headphones, pair them with a warm DAC and amp and make it sound a bit natural or warm? Is it really that simple? From Roland. Sort of. There's certain types of source gear which will have a drastic effect on the sound that you get out of your chain, and a lot of the time it's because they are actually changing the frequency response of what you're getting out. Not necessarily because that amplifier or that DAC or whatever is coloured and changing the frequency response in and of itself, but because of how it is interacting with your headphones. If you use a tube amp, for example, or something with a high output impedance, on dynamic driver headphones that will change the frequency response of your headphones. And so, yes, it will have a drastic impact, but then most solid state stuff has a very low output impedance, and so you won't get that same effect. Just outside of that, looking at normal amplifiers, normal DACs, low output impedance, all that kind of stuff, so it's not changing the frequency response of your headphones, my personal opinion is you get a small change based on things like the harmonic distortion profile of the amplifier or the reconstruction filter in the DAC, but that is it. You don't get a big change in tonality that is going to take a headphone that is bright to being neutral or taking something you don't like to being something you like. Don't try and fix a headphone you don't enjoy with changing source gear. Get your headphones and transducers sorted, get something you really enjoy, and then get the most out of them with source gear. Don't try and fix a bad headphone with good source gear. What is the difference between PCM and DSD from Dan Mellinger? Well, I think it's easiest to describe this as PCM is most like playing Connect the Dots, and DSD is most like playing Flappy Bird. L let me explain. With PCM audio, which is the most widely used form of digital audio today, you have a series of samples, typically 44,100 times a second, which describes what amplitude the waveform should have at that point in time. So you have a series of these samples close enough together that if you just connect the dots between them, you get the original waveform that was recorded. The closer those samples are together, so the higher the sample rate, the higher a frequency you can reconstruct. And the mass that is used to actually reconnect the dots between those samples is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, it's called a sync function, but that's basically how it works. You have a series of samples, they describe where the waveform should be at that moment, and you just connect all the dots together. DSD, I said, was a little bit like playing Flappy Bird, and the reason that I said that was because with DSD, you can't just describe where the waveform is at a given point in time. Each sample is one bit, meaning it can only be maximum or minimum. And in Flappy Bird, you can't just touch on the screen and hold, and draw a line as to where you want the bird to go. You have to tap. Each tap just contains the same amount of information, and you control how high up the bird goes by more taps in a given period of time, and then you let it go down by not tapping. The same thing works in DSD. The more one-bit pulses there are in a given period of time, the higher up the waveform goes. And the less one-bit pulses there are in a given period of time, the lower the waveform goes. It kind of works like Flappy Bird. That's the simplest analogy I can think of. So PCM has a lower sample rate, but each sample has a lot more information, and they describe exactly where the waveform is at a given moment. DSD has a much, much higher sample rate, but only one bit of information in each one, and it's about how many one-bit pulses there are in a given period of time to push the waveform up, or how many there aren't to let it fall down. Those were some great questions, and if you've got a question which you'd like to see answered in a future episode of this series, then head over to the headphones.com forum and submit your question in the audio support submissions thread. There's a link in the description. Get subscribed to see future episodes. Thanks for watching.